Hi everyone. The pain must enter into its glorious, glorified life of memory before it can turn into compassion. So wrote George Eliot in her novel Middlemarch. An important lesson for sure, and one which also applies to FPL managers in the evolving drama of Solly March, which seems to overtake all discussion this weekend on the Bird app, with non-owners in pure popcorn mode watching the stills being posted and the behavioural analyses of Jack Harrison's interviews being conducted. Pure hilarity. Aside from that, it's been an pretty underwhelming time so far, I'd say, this week, which seems to be the norm nowadays, especially especially for those with recent wildcards, as those who did hit the bench boost and feast on his Arsenal returns other than Saka ruled the roost this week. And in the real world, sanity seems to prevail, prevail this morning uh, with the news that Gary Lineker will be back on match of the day next week, following a hasting show of solidarity across BBC Sport this week against attempts to silence dissenters against the controversial government policy. Again, to quote George Elliott, same people did what their neighbour did so that if any lunatics were at large, one might know and avoid them. I certainly blocked a fair few of those over the weekend. And in the midst of all this nonsense, it's safe to say, Lucy, that this week we're going to be much more confident in looking forward uh, rather than meditating on the events, right? <laughs> You're all right. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Although, as one of those aforementioned Solly March owners, I guess my George Elliott quote of the day is, what we call our despair is often only the painful eagerness of unfed hope. Oh, well, gorgeous. I shall cling on to that hope for another fixture at least. Uh, we are Who Got the Assists. You can find Tom on the main account at WGTA underscore FPL. And I'm Lucy Heinett at Lucy Heinett. On the pod today, we'll first zoom out to take a look at the 200 Club and the top 10 progression so far this season in contrast to previous seasons. We'll see who might break through into that as the season reaches the business end. We'll then zoom in on the fixtures ahead to discuss, firstly, Mr Erling Haaland, should we sell or not, and who for. Alongside this, we'll consider some key picks for the free hit if you're going down that route. And then we'll finish off on some listener questions. We're recording on the evening of Monday the 13th of March with Brentford, Brighton, Palace and the mighty Southampton all to come on Wednesday evening with fingers firmly crossed. Up the Saints. Right. Yes, indeed. So, yes, a little bit of a way to go. I do think it's worth just giving a quick interim min league update. I will be finally able to give a full one in a couple of weeks. So we'll take next week off just to quickly signpost that. Um, but in a couple of weeks, obviously, after blank, we'll be able to give a full one uh, as it is. 10th is Alison Wonderland, Erin Butler, up from 12th. In 9th, Adam Bell, uh, Adam Football Club, up from 11th. In 8th, up from 14th, Arav Medirata, Arav Medirata, the Canes Gambit, uh, up from 14th to 8th. In 7th, down from 5th, the Sweet, Boy, the Sweet Blues Boys, Victor Sunday, uh, down, from, down from 5th to 7th. In 6th, up from 10th, it's Josiah, uh, very dazed in the Eternal Flame. In fifth, up from ninth, is Alex Terry, Sack of Potatoes. I think Alex has been knocking, or I feel like I've said his name quite a few times, haven't I? Um, Calcetta FC, Leonardo Silva, up in fourth uh, from seventh. Top three where they were. Uh, in third, it's uh, Daniel Strand, Strand United. And the top two, it's really kind of coming on now. So for a long time, Mark Bleakley was miles out in front, um, but he lost momentum a little bit, sadly, due to that ill-fated Game Week 26 wildcard that I'm sure many of us can empathise with. In contrast, in second, Andy Nichols has absolutely stormed it recently. So it doesn't sound like much, but he's gone up from 800 OR to 131 OR in four weeks, which are huge jumps proportionally. It's a huge, huge week for him this week as well. He's on 73 with Kane captain. It's a really differential team, though. Only Tony, no Bryson at all, which I guess goes to show that you can still profit from huge bets outside of the template. Okay. Very well done, Andy, uh, for forging your own path there. Wow. Uh, yeah, don't really see that on FPL Twitter, that's for sure. And I guess a quick market force update as well before we go into our own teams. Um, obviously mid-game week, but the likes of Haaland, who we'll discuss in a little bit, being sold. Um, Salah as well being sold. Blanca, De Bruyne, Mares, Darwin, all Blancas all being sold. Brought in Ben Chilwell, over 100,000 transfers in for the Chilinator. Yes, so uh, I think I'll, we'll have a little bit to talk, discuss on him later on. Uh, Kane, uh, almost 100,000 transfers in for him. Uh, Watkins, 80,000 transfers. And Almiron, I guess he scored a goal, 79,000 transfers in, in for him. And Martinelli, 72,000 transfers in for him. So, yeah, very reactive and very kind of uh, in keeping with what we're about to see with the blank game week coming. 
Right, uh, a sort of joint game week update, Lucy. I mean, it's, it's again very slim margins, isn't it? It's uh, yes, it's a uh, whether it was Solly March sticking his leg in between Jack Harrison's legs, or whether it was Jack Harrison hooking into his own net, basically, which seems to be the difference here. Yes, I mean. If it is the Jack Harrison thing, I, I can't conclusively say either way. If it is Jack Harrison, what was he actually doing? I, I still don't understand what don't his know. foot was trying to do. That, that's always going in the net. Anyway, I'm going to get over that. That's fine. It's not kept me awake at night, I promise. Um, <laughs> I'm on 48, so that's not great. Um, a sizable red, so I am hoping that turns round. Um, I did think it was nice to see Harry Kane reward the faith of putting him in the wildcard team. I did think to start with that maybe I'd overcommitted on that one, but given that he's an obvious-ish captaincy choice, or, or definitely in mm. the talking for captaincy this coming week, and having got that 13-pointer, that's rather nice. Um, I think I'm not alone. Indeed, you had exactly the same problem in having a very painful bench experience this week. Um, with Odegaard and Gabrielle stuck on there. Um, I think I would have probably come to terms with a Gabrielle clean sheet and an Odegaard goal, but the goal for Gabrielle really, really was the stinger on that one. Um, so anyway, if you had the good sense to bench boost, well done. Um, I think we both discussed it and decided against it in the end. So um, I I don't know if I have such high hopes for my own bench boost, but there we go. Yeah. 26 points isn't it i mean it's, it's, it's one it's one of those where um so the the, the, the outer reaches of of what you would have expected uh I'd kind of made peace with the fact that those two players were on my bench and had decided not to bench boost so it's not a case that i'm holding myself responsible thinking oh you know i could have done it um but nonetheless yeah if, if you have bench boosted well that's, that's quite a bounty and I, I suspect that our actual bench boost is their actual bench boosts will be a bit of a damp squid compared to that one won't they yeah, well done if you did. Um, I think Matthew Jones said to me, "Oh, you know, just be careful." Because I was I was quite blasé on Sunday. You know, just be careful. I think there's a quite high ownership of uh, Arsenal defenders. Uh, Man United defenders. Sure, sure got yellow car, which took him down from eight to five at the very very late on in the game, which was a little bit lucky. But yeah, but obviously. Gabriel and Odegaard. I was watching that game as well in the pub, so it was kind of a bittersweet moment when the when those goals went in. Um, I, I'm on 53, um, so five points more than you, thanks to McAllister, basically. And I have a green arrow of 300 places or something like that. So yeah, it, it's it's very fine margins at the moment. It really is. Um, yeah, we've still got six players to play, so hopefully Ivan Tony will show up. I think there's one big chance missed as long um, as he in, in, in the game. Fun. So yeah. Yeah, and Brent, yeah, well, you know, we'll take uh, what we're gonna do a three two, a four three win for Southampton with a Tony yeah. hat trick, something like that. Yeah, plenty of assists for Henry. Yeah, yeah, and then Raya with loads of saves after you know, Shay Adams barrage. Well, we'll can miss a penalty and then tap it in. How about that? Yeah, That's yeah, we'll take that. We'll take that. Okay, excellent. Well, that's just never gonna happen, but okay, let's 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 move on to the main topic this week then. It is a 200 club, uh, so yeah. Something that we speak about an awful lot, and you know, Holland breached the 200 club this weekend. Who we got 200 the first player, unsurprisingly, who got there? I mean, how would you describe the 200 club, Lucy? It's something that we've spoken about a fair bit in the past, isn't it? Well, I guess they're it's fairly self-explanatory, right? They're the, they're the players that score over 200 points. They're the guys that we have kind of most frequently ever present in our teams or close to. They're the people we depend on for our captaincy. They're the guys that we build our teams around, I guess. Um, occasionally, we might have that thing where we bounce between them to try and maximise captaincy options. But in the main, I'd say that they are the the kind of big players in our teams and the people that we try to make sure we kind of make a feature of. Perfect. Yeah, it's the exalted group of players who are allowed to walk past the velvety ropes into their own private Is members area. <laughs> The official definition is that one. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Uh, they, they hit that kind of, you know, the vaunted 200 points milestone in FPL. A very select few of individuals actually get there. Um, I do keep tra- track of it as part of my Talisman Theory article. It'll be interesting to see uh, how it's progressed this year uh, at the very end. Um, I may even break out and do two pieces this summer. I, I don't know. We'll see how I'm feeling. Um, but yeah, in terms of the 200 club, a quick recent history. Last season, five of them made it. Uh, so Salah scored. Uh, top score for the for the third time in the last six years, followed by Son. Remember him in second. Trent Bowen and Cancelo. Remember him. All in the two hundred club. 
the year before it was just four at that highly affordable quad of Bruno, Kane, Salah and Son. Then we had eight in a row for two years, respectively, in 2019-20 and 2018-19, three in 2017-18, and six back in the midst of time in 2016-17, when Alexis Sanchez topped the list, and I was much younger and better looking. Now, that means that you end up with an average of five and two thirds in the 200 club every year. But obviously, obviously, each season's different, so we need to see what the scenario is. But with Haaland reached the 200 club season already with his penalty against Palace. We thought it was basically a good time to check in on how things are going this year, both the 200 club and by extension, the top 10 players in FPL. And I guess see how things have looked at this point in the past, how it ended up. And if there's anything we can take away from what we're seeing, let's look then at the next, at the last three years. I think that's probably enough uh, to bear in mind. Um, and here it is. If you are watching on YouTube, if not, I will speak over it in just a second. But yes, I've taken basically a barometer around game week 27. So most of these years, the the year would have, the, the game week would have concluded. Obviously, we are mid sort of double game week, but hey, no, it's, 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 there's never a perfect comparison. It's a qualitative look at it. Uh, just to give the scoop, really, rather than read all through, uh, the top 10 at the moment reads as such. You've got Holland at the top, obviously, on 203, Kane in second on 76, Rashford, Salah, Saka, and Trippier both uh, joint on fifth. Odegaard and Martinelli, all kind of around the 150 points mark. Uh, in eighth, it's Almiron, 136. In ninth, it's Tony, 132. And just creeping into tenth, it's Kevin De Bruyne, 129. I think there's a few sort of key points to make from this. And I, I think I'm just going to just kind of reel them through and mention a few individual sort of bits and pieces from the past rather than going through everything. The first key point I'd make is that we're near to the usual average about now in terms of the top 10. So the average of 150 point, 154 points, something like that in the top 10 at the moment, it's very similar to previous years. So it's not an a similar year, uh, a dissimilar year to the past, despite the fact that we missed the game week. Uh, Holland would already be in the top 10 in each of the past six seasons, and Kane with 176 would already be there in two of the last six. But it's really unusual to have so many players in the 150 points category already. There's eight there already this year, whereas normally there's five or six. The other thing to mention is that it's amazing how fixed it is by this point. So over the last couple of years, eight of the top 10 by this point end up in the top 10. So eight of the individuals that I ruled off earlier on are likely to stay there. I think three years ago in Project Restart, it was seven. And the top scorer by this point in the season has always ended up the top overall scorer every single time for the last three seasons. So this year, Horder might make it. In the past, it's been Salah, Bruno, Kevin De Bruyne. They've all made it. Kevin De Bruyne even made it through Project Restart. Um, the kinds of players as well who do make it through over the last few years vary, but they tend to be the usual suspects. So the few players do drop out. The likes of last year, Bernardo Silva. Remember that great run he had over sort of Christmas time into the early spring in eighth, and Diogo Jota was in ninth. Again, very similar sort of run before he got injured. I still remember Klopp saying, Diogo, no. And people on Twitter were kind of dissecting what that could possibly mean and turned out he was out for a while. So they dropped out and were replaced by Kevin De Bruyne and Harry Kane, both of whom had a ridiculous end to the season. Uh, KDB scored a 76 points and Kane scored a whopping 83 points over the final 11 game weeks. So it can happen. We also saw in the past with like Sadio Mane in 2021, overturning Ilkay Gundogan and Raheem Sterling and Anthony Martial coming from nowhere in Project Restart in 2019-20 to, uh, to push uh, the likes of Robertson and Van Dijk out of the top 10. And the other weird, the only weird one here is Stuart Dallas. I remember him, 2020-21. Uh, he actually came 10th overall. He overturned Dominic Calvert-Lewin after scoring 51 points in the last 11 weeks after a brace against Man City. So yeah, I mean, it's definitely one where I think the top 10 players in FPL right now, Lucy, are going to probably be the ones who are mostly going to be sticking there. There are a few candidates to drop. I mean, any thoughts from, from kind of looking at this data and just kind of having to think about it over the course of the day? Um, well, I guess I don't want to push my agenda too much, but I guess the fact that we've got two strikers at the top of the standings is fairly unusual. Um, we often have one around there, but it's normally a... The 200 club is normally dominated by those premium midfielders that, that do well or, or premium defenders at a push, like Trent, for example. Um, but the, yeah, normally it's the Son, Salas, Brunos, etc. And it's interesting that we have Haaland already there and Kane only 24 points to go. So you'd think he makes it quite easily. Mm. Um, so interesting from that perspective, you know, I think we spent a lot of time at the beginning of the season deliberating about which premium midfielders we should have, which premium defenders we should have. And to a certain extent, although we'd kind of booked in Haaland, 
as a result, Kane wasn't really spoken about and we assumed we'd be kind of working with a, a structure which involved one premium striker. Um, so, yeah, I think that's quite interesting. Um, I think the value is probably the standout point of all of them. Um, the fact that last season, if you looked at the top 10, we had Salah, Son, Trent, Bowen, Cancelo, KDB, Kane, Robertson, Van Dyke, Mane. So only one of those, Bowen, you would say, was kind of a mid-tier player the rest of them were were kind of premium within their category you know obviously they vary significantly in price depending on position but they are primarily the premium players and that's usually what you'd expect because that's why you're playing a premium price um this year if you put um Salah and Kane and Harlan to one side you've got Martinelli, Odegaard, Saka, Trippier, Rashford none of those were premium in their category by a long stretch. And that's obviously created this game where we haven't worried too much about transfer value and we've been able to cram in a lot more of these players. Um, so I guess that's the kind of big thing. Um, yeah, I, don't, yeah. I don't know if there's anything else that, that struck, you, struck you about it. No, that's that's correct. So I, I it's kind of like 2015-16, which I haven't got the data for here, but I do have the data in my mind from when I did it little while ago and what's really interesting about the Leicester season was that this season is the most similar to it because you had the likes of Kane, Eriksen, Ali, Vardy, Mares, um, who you could fit into your team very easily and you had like Alexis Sanchez hanging around things like that but there was no real need to spend big because you could fit in all of the likely lads in your team and that's what we're seeing this year with the likes of Odegaard, Marcinelli, Saka, all providing prodigious value and it's a strange year in many ways because you know in some ways most times or um, mostly around this time of the season people are flexing their team value and being able to fit in a ridiculous sort of squad this year that doesn't at the moment feel that way just because the arsenal guys have given us sort of a massive discount on the 200 club nominees as it were who you normally fix in your team and set and forget and alongside that the emergence of the Brighton players it just sort of means that there's lots of money sloshing around I and mean, it's not really a team value sort of game anymore it's more just about finding that value which, which I quite like I think that's more of a different challenge than hey I'm able to fit in all of these premium players like we saw in 2020 21 when Bruno Kane Salah Son if you had them all in your team it didn't really matter who else you had because they were just so productive and so consistent all the way along. But the only other thing I'd mention, perhaps, is that we, we've normally had at least two Liverpool representatives in the top 10. So normally Mane and Salah, obviously, uh, but last year we had Trent and Van Dijk both in there. And um, that's obviously not happened this season with Salah um, still in there, uh, the fourth highest scoring player, thanks in part to 21 points versus United, that's for sure. Um, but it's Arsenal who have really taken over that mantle with three of their players in the top 10, Martinelli, Odegaard and Saka. I think that's really fascinating, to be honest, because, well, we're not going to see that level of value next year. That's for sure. I think all of these players are going to be 9, 10, something like that. So it, we're really kind of at, at the last sort of, well, towards the end of the season, it'll be the kind of the final throes of these players being so cheap. So it's a case of just enjoying it while you can, because next year you won't be able to fit all these players in unless FPL do something drastic and <laughs> bow to the trend of, people wanting to fit all their favourites in, but I, I can't see it. So you know, these guys, effectively, given the average point output of a player who normally is in the top 10 by this point, are way outperforming their price. So, yeah, just enjoy it while you can and enjoy the fact that you can fit these players in because it won't be there next year. Yeah, I think you did touch on it um, briefly there but as you're going through the data, but um, there are a lot of them clustered around this 150 mark and looking at the historic data... It's a bit touch and go as to whether you make the two hundred club from that point. Um, where are you? Well, who do you think will make it from those those players clustered around that one hundred and fifty mark? So, what's interesting is I I think given the fact that we've had minimal, we've had two or three players dropping off, and the identity of the players who are in the top ten, I. I've got a feeling, well, I know that Kane and, and uh, Holland will make it. I'm sure Kane and Holland will make it or stay in the top 10. Um, Rashford and Salah, I can see probably kind of retaining their space. I think the Arsenal boys will, and I assume Trippier will, because there's so many fixtures to go. So I think maybe kind of, I mean, at the moment it's kind of a top 11, because Saka and Trippier are both 
equal on, in yeah, fifth. Yeah. I think the top seven, so everybody from 150 plus, is probably going to make it. And given I mean, Martinelli would have been a nominee three or four weeks ago as a player who could fall off. Remember when Trossard was going to steal his minutes forever and he was never going to play a game of football again? Well, it, it seems like that's gone the other way now. So I, I think it's probably going to be the fact that we'll, we'll see three of the top 10, top 11 drop out this year. But the, the, the rest, I'd be fairly confident in keeping their place. But yeah, but do you think they make 200? Is my question, really. Mm, okay, so Kane, I think, will. Rashford, if he can rediscover it, might. I, I wouldn't bet against Salah making it. I think those are the ones that I go for. Kane. So you don't think any Arsenal boys make it? Kane, Rashford, Salah. It's a big ask, isn't it? Um, I've, I think they've all got... The problem is, it reminds me of Liverpool back in the day when you have Firmino, Coutinho... Uh, and Mane and Salah and it was kind of cannibalizing points and, and that's kind of a big problem isn't it that the points are so spread around that team and there isn't a particular Salah who stood out as you can see borne out in the numbers whether they're able to all together if, if we are able to win every single game 3-0 from here on in then sure they might make it will one make it this year I, I just I can't quite see it happening I, I think probably looking kind of nesting out about 190 something like that for the likes of Saka and all it would take though is one mad game wouldn't it so yeah. if, uh, if Nodegaard had a Salah game and suddenly he was on 170 180 then yeah okay sure it's, it's 11 games to go and it's just it's just testament to the season that Arsenal have had really that you've got the players there already and within touch and distance and the next couple of games are pretty good, aren't they? And the Leeds game, mm. the game of 29 particularly, we might be looking at that and thinking, oh, that could be another 4-0. So, it, I don't know, I, I felt that they wouldn't quite make it, but now, I, now I'm thinking again, maybe one will. I'm not sure which, though. I, I, I genuinely don't know. Yeah, I would gamble that one makes it, but I wouldn't be able to tell you which one does. Um, I think it could be Martinelli, actually, if if things go as they have recently and obviously Jesus is back. It could be him. Um, but yeah, I agree with you mostly. I think Salah makes it again, which would be staggering given how poor Liverpool were for parts of the season and how many times he must have made. I mean, I don't have all of the stats, Tom, but presumably you do. How, how many seasons in a row would that be? Uh, it would be, was it five in a row? No, six in a row. Yeah, he's oh, been he's been, he's been there every season since 2017, 18 and tops it three times. Crazy. Yeah, that's mad consistency, isn't it, really? And you, you wouldn't bet against it, especially if I mean, we talk about motivation much later on in this pod, but especially if there's, there's nothing left for Liverpool except to go for four. I mean, yeah, I mean, you wouldn't you wouldn't bet against it happening. Very, very strange indeed. Uh, a very, very strange season in many ways. Um, so, I mean, the, below the 150, you've got Almer on the 136, Tony on 132, and KDB on 129. And I, I think that there's probably fair kind of a fair question mark, I'd say, against all three of them staying yeah. in place. Almer, Almeron's drop off, I mean, did score this week, but the red hot form we saw, I, I looked at it earlier, between game weeks nine and 17, he amassed 10 returns, four double digit hauls in nine weeks, 8.8 .8 points per game, 79 points. And those recent nine games, in contrast, he's managed two goals and a total of 35 points. So it was still respectable, 3.8 points per game. But he's never been the same since the World Cup, Lucy, uh, since uh, Paraguay's uh, no, non-entry. Um, and you've got Tony. Will he be banned? We don't know. No idea. Um, but I'm assuming that Brentford will want him to be banned sooner rather than later so he gets back early next season. And uh, De Bruyne... Obviously, we've got no clue, have we, about what the hell is going on with him. I mean, maybe the team is evolving beyond him a slight bit. But it's amazing how he's gone from sort of semi-talisman or you know, sloppy second talisman to being in and out of the team, isn't it? I wouldn't be surprised to see him drop off. So I think this year is going to be slightly atypical with the last few years. I think we'll, we'll see three maybe breakthroughs uh, maybe arrive into that top 10. But who do you think they might be? Any sort of nominees for players to keep an eye on over the next 10, 11 game weeks to see what would happen there? Um. I give me one second. I'm just gonna have a quick look because I didn't do this bit. Um, I wonder, and, and I, I, I don't want to say there's any real strengths of commitment. Don't say what, Browse. 
<laughs> she's she's yeah. going to score a double hat trick. Oh no, it's Paul Prowse. I'll scratch that out. She's going to score a double, double hat trick every game. Yeah, That's double hat trick. <laughs> no, I was going to say um, Bruno Fernandes actually could yes. do it. Yep. Um, obviously on 119 at the moment and obviously has looked better since the departure of Ronaldo and all of that stuff. So maybe he's one to look out for. I think he's had three double digit hauls since the restart so that's that's pretty decent and obviously is yeah as I said a lot more of a kind of talismanic figure now that Ronaldo's not there so he would probably be one of the ones I'd be looking at I don't know if you have any others yeah so Bruno was the top one I had actually I know he played in the double pivot I think um against Southampton alongside the Casemiro yeah, it was um, just because of the sending off, I think. Yeah, I think yeah, I, I think he I think he started there with Sancho in the ten and uh, about their course up front. So he oh yeah, he did. Yeah, yeah. But what I mean, I think he stayed there. Partly. Oh, okay, I see. Yeah, I mean, uh, but but I think looking at the fixtures for United of the remaining twelve games, they've got Newcastle, Chelsea, and Spurs of the kind of the top seven, and all three of them are having their own sort of travail. And then they're running in particular between game weeks 34 and the end of the season. It's just crazy. Villa, West Ham, Wolves, Bournemouth and Fulham is where they end. So, I mean, that's that's one of those fixture runs where you just think, hey, you know what? He could easily pick up 30, 40 points from that and make up 10 points that he's behind KDB on and get there. I I would not be surprised by that. Another nominee, maybe, is uh, Wally Watkins. Um, I mean, he's further back. He's uh, 18 behind 10th on 111. A bit more dubious, but he's been a great run recently. And we've seen it before with strikers like Ings, that if they do get into the groove, then they could prove unstoppable. And while, why have he got ignored by the community until now, really? Uh, since Game Week 21, he's returned seven times in seven games. A total of 42 points, six points per game under Emery. And he's now up to kind of 13th for, for non-pin XGI, according to XBref, FBref, and up to 8th for XG, like out of nowhere. I think he was like kind of 25th, something like that, when I last looked at him around the, the restart of the World Cup. So really come on leaps and bounds, really. Anyone for you? Yeah, no, I was about to say on Watkins, actually, because I've kind of looked into it as we talk about transfers for, for the coming week. Um, If you look at his kind of granular data from the last seven or eight games since he's been on that run, aside from the Arsenal and City games, where you wouldn't have expected him to get those goals that he got anyway... His XGI data looks excellent. So, yeah, if he can keep that up, I, I'd be really encouraged by that. Um, I just think that maybe he's he's maybe left it too late for the top 10, just in terms of he's kind of come out of nowhere and, and is still, what, t- 22 points off Tony. So hmm. th- that's, that's quite a gap to make up. Um, it, it is. It, I think there, you might end up with uh, like fourth place where just – like someone that everyone's rubbish but someone kind of gets it by default <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. It, it's really difficult looking through it because and i think this underlines how hard it is to forecast stuff like this and come the end of the season there will be one person who comes out of left field and suddenly looks brilliant there, there are loads who've just got too much to do so i was looking at you know Alex, alexis McAllister, for example he's on 98 points at the moment i, I was looking at bryson because they've got so many games in hand and the way they're playing you wouldn't be surprised if one of them at least made the top 10 maybe in McAllister because he's kind of that playing that 8.5 role as above average say I think he's reached fourth for non-pen goal involvement amongst midfielders over the last six weeks and on penalties like it wouldn't take too much for him to get there but there's still an awful long way to go 31 points and James Madison as well a uh, similar vein so he's on the hunt, just over the 100 mark at the moment but a really nice run of fixtures for Leicester up till game week 35 they don't play another uh, that's when they've got a few dicey games. But between now and going to be 35, they only play one team in uh, the top seven, which is City. The rest of them are teams in and around them. Um, and he's been very unlucky the last couple of weeks, hasn't he? I, mean, it was, it was, yeah. I think it was Armati, I think it was Armati who just missed a, a great almost assist, basically, this week. And against you guys, obviously. Ian Atto just missed everything, yeah, against us. So he's been very unlucky. Well, there we go. Bruno Fernandes. Ollie Watkins, do your thing. <laughs> we'll see how uh, how that goes in the future. And if, if Tony isn't banned, then, then maybe he'll be a good a good candidate just for keeping his spot. Right, that was fun. Let's zoom in to the present. Erling Haaland, 200 points this season, but on the sell list for many, as you heard in Market Forces. I mean, it's just a short word, I guess, on the impact of an FPL this season. It's, it's just been 
revolutionary, really, hasn't it, in many ways? Yeah, I think he's become that dependable, ever-present figure in FPL teams that Salah felt like he was for so many seasons. Um, I think he's also been like a really obvious route into a Premier League team that is often very difficult for players, FPL players, to predict. I think Pep's willingness to give him Premier League starts when he's fit even during Champions League weeks, has probably taken us by surprise a little. I think there was the thought that Haaland always had a huge ceiling at City when he first came, but but would he necessarily get the minutes over the season or the starts over the season? And it's been quite clear that he does and he will. Um, and, and obviously that's been at a time where someone, as we said, like Kevin De Bruyne has had much more limited minutes. They've had a lot more churn at the back than we used to, the whole Cancelo incident, for example. So he's given you that kind of like easy Man City option that we probably didn't expect him to be. Um, I think he's also been a pain to manage from an effective ownership perspective. I think going against him has left many brokenhearted. Um, I think he's he's sort of changed the way we play the game to a certain extent because because he took captaincy off the table for a fair few weeks. Um, I think it's probably worth mentioning that he's only scored more than one goal in two games since the restart, having got three hat-tricks and two braces prior to the World Cup. I don't think that means he's not worth owning um, because he's still very consistent. But I think that has perhaps relaxed us in the last few weeks about trying other captaincy options in the doubles and stuff. That's probably been a bit of a relief, I think. (laughs) Yeah, that that FOMO has definitely happened. I think you're right. Like. it's interesting, isn't it? The removal of captaincy. It's, it's two sides of the coin. So if you're doing well, I mean, I slash we had a good start to the season. And if you just left the captain on him, you could just retain position, really. You've, there's a good bet that you would because you'd always have that captain. Um, around that time, you have less engaged managers playing who would be captaining all sorts. So, you know, you'd let them make the mistake and just kind of keep kind of trickling upwards. But on the other hand, if you were looking you know, to gain, as you kind of referenced, one of the biggest facts in gaining every week, the captainship, was neutralised. There's, there's nothing you could really do. And it, it came down to that sort of, I think we are talking about the gameful eight or the gameful nine last week. And it was, it's all been about the gameful 10, hasn't it, this season, more than anything. Um, and getting on bandwagons like Almiron very early. I mean, those sorts of things were the things that made the biggest difference. But I think this year, especially with the removal of captains, one thing that I think has been really interesting is the fact that we've not really seen that many kind of captaincy swings. You know, normally it's just been right, Captain Holland, let's get on with it. Um, whereas kind of it's been it's only really, really recently we've seen them come back into focus. So Saka versus Salah in 25, Matoma versus Tony this week, perhaps. Um those events are so memorable because they've been so scarce um, and I've enjoyed it a lot because I've been scared, scarred, scared. I've been scared by them as well. Uh, so heavily in the past, by these sorts of swings going against me. So, you know, Havertz versus Salah, Antonio versus Bowen. I've been on the wrong side of all sorts of captaincy calls in the past. So it's actually been quite easy for me to just remove captaincy from my consideration. Uh, but I know other people kind of really like taking the gamble. So I think, I think that's kind of been the main thing this this year, sort of removing that sort of captaincy question every week and gives you something, something less to think about, which is always quite nice. Now, are you looking to sell this week? Uh, there are a couple of uh, people have written in about this. So uh, at Nathan, FPL, Mel, are people overlooking the team value aspect of selling Haaland? After game week 30, we'll probably want Liverpool again. So budget can get tight if we're squeezing in the likes of Darwin, Trent, Salah, as well as Haaland back. And Shane, FPL veteran, says he's not selling Haaland. Uh, one fixture in 29 versus Liverpool, which he says is a great fixture in reality. And with great fixtures moving forward, he asks, will Haaland become a differential for the first time? He hopes so. So it's a solid keep for him. Are you getting rid? I am. Um, he would be out in 28 and back in 30. I, d- I think anyone that goes longer than that, given that he's got Southampton and Leicester in 30 and 31, is a, they're very brave people. Um, or, or they're people that perhaps are using the money elsewhere and taking the risk, which is which is fair enough. Um, I think in terms of selling him now, I think there's a decent argument for it, just on the basis that he has a blank followed by a single when there are opportunities for someone like Watkins who has a single followed by a double. So you're effectively swapping one fixture for three. And that, for me, is enough just about to compensate for the loss of a couple of free transfers and um, obviously the team value locked up in him. I think that point about overlooking team value um, is a very fair one. I've, I've seen a lot of people doing their calculations for future transfers in a single transfer page on the FPL site. 
don't do that because <laughs> <laughs> you just take Harland out and put him back in. That doesn't tell you how much he costs to buy back. Like you, I just don't do that. I've seen so many people been showing screenshots of how they're going to do it, and I'm like, I, I don't think you've taken into account how much that will cost you to bring him back. So I do think you do need to think about that and actually probably thinking about future transfers and team value and the things I might lose on Harland has probably got under my skin too much. Um, I don't have great team value and I didn't have great team value going into the wild card, um, particularly not compared to your team, which obviously got the benefit of the nonsense that happened as a result of the the Queen's tragic death. So I I felt that a little bit when I did my wild card draft and it did mean that I made a last minute move a tragic last minute move uh, to remove McAllister for March because I thought at least that would get me a little bit more money in the bank, knowing that, you know, that would be useful for I mean, things like we're buying back Ireland. We're midway through the game week. I mean, you know, March could go off and score a brace like our, 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 our former podcast, Jan Batra, was anticipating. So, you know, it, 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 this could all be moot and you could be like, yeah, that's a great decision. I mean, it could be, but it seems unlikely. I think actually no. it's worth pointing out, actually, I've seen a bit of a, a bit of panic about March. Like, that was an incredible freak incident. If that hadn't happened, they'd have ended up levelish on points and no one would have really talked about it. I, I think you've just got to put that down to bad luck. I do think McAllister's the better pick, but the, the gap isn't as big as the points look at the moment. Um, but yes, the, the fact is that Team Valley got right under my skin. I was worrying about how I'd buy Harlan back eventually and it led to a bad decision. So as much as I do believe that Valley was important, swapping one fixture for three seems like a good deal. So I will be doing that. And I will be buying him back pretty sharpish. How about you? Yep, I'm selling as well. And I, I think that remember the last time we sold a player for a week or two. Let's not talk about it. Yeah, so Trent Alexander Arnold twenty uh, twenty. How many points was it? It was a little, awful lot of points <laughs> comes to mind. Um, with selling a player for a week or two, um, and I, I, I can see straight away the classic narrative emerging. Um, how Hall and Mass sold for Watkins, you blanks in game week 29, while Hall and smashed in a hat trick at home against an inconsistent Liverpool and gives us all a massive red arrow on our bench boosts. I think that's that's what's going to happen. And um, that said, I think it makes a lot of sense to move him on this week, uh, to maximize this week, and just basically stack my deck basically, um, for that double game week 29. I'll discuss later a little bit how I'm being perhaps more cautious than I perhaps was when I first discussed it. But um, I, I think that that's going to be something that I do look at. And as you mentioned, the butterfly effect of the Queen's death uh, meant that I had a two-week wild card. So in answer to Nate's point, um, I've got ludicrous team value. So I've got a good enough cushion according to FPL team to just be able to afford Holland, Salah, Trent, and just put it all together, um, which shouldn't be as bad for me. But yeah, definitely, as Lucy said, make sure it works for you outside looking at the FPL website because you're still going to have to find 0.4, probably 0.3. I'm sure he'll drop um, to be able to afford Holland back. In fact, they probably won't let him drop that far, will they? Because you know, he's still Holland and you know what they're like. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's just one that you have to keep an eye on. And I think uh, game week 30, I mean, Gaurav wrote in to say um, he's not sure whether why people are selling Tony over Watkins game we first him. Of course, I bet we come to it, but the potential ban for Tony probably means that Watkins stays. Best of fixtures for Tony as well probably means that Watkins stays. Um, but yeah, I mean, all right, I'm talking like actually, I'm talking like I'm I'm buying Watkins or I bought Watkins already. I'm assuming I'm going to buy Watkins. I mean, is he the the, the keeper simple stupid option? Is there anybody else? I mean, obviously, Payne second at the moment in. I think you obviously be prioritizing is it obvious you'll be prioritizing buying Kane in straight away if you don't own him and otherwise is it Watkins is there anyone else on the radar no I guess Kane isn't necessarily obvious if you're kind of big into double game weeks because he doesn't have a double I mean he should be I think because I think he's a great option this week from a captaincy perspective and then even if you don't want to captain him I expect him to be heavily owned so any kind of return could be really damaging um so yeah I would have Kane over anything else um Watkins, I think, is the obvious option. I think we spoke about all of his stats, so I won't go into those again. Bournemouth is obviously a great fixture for, for this coming week. And I think the double is less attractive than other doubles, but I think Leicester aren't great defensively, and he obviously got that mm. goal and assist against them in 22. So he's 
he knows how to find a route past them so I think that's fine. I'm. I know that uh, FPL review is, is quite hot on Solanke. <laughs> yes, it is. Yes. I I really yeah. can't get behind that one. He hasn't scored since the World Cup, and the stats don't look particularly compelling either. Having skimmed through those since the restart, so I'm not wild on that one. I think if you were looking for an alternative to Watkins at a similar price point, it would be Havertz. And even then, I'm not mar- not like particularly hot on that one either. Uh, I just don't think he he's I don't think he's much of a goal scorer. I actually think he's a good player, but I just don't think he's that yeah. much of a goal scorer. Um, and it comes down to that kind of weird eye testy thing more than anything. Um, but yeah, he'd be where I'd go if you weren't going to go for Watkins for whatever reason. Yeah, end products FC. I mean, Watkins. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the the fact that the the crowd are going to go there and he creates an EO threat, which is the most boring reason to buy a player. But it also, you know, there's what, the other. What is his ownership at the moment? Just having I, I don't think it's. I, I don't think it's particularly high. I think it's kind of. I need to have a look actually. Um... Sorry, that was a bit harsh. I thought sorry, you might sorry. have. That's oh, right. Don't worry. Um, it is at the moment uh, ten uh, below ten percent. But I think you're kind of going to be looking at. I mean, majority of people who are still playing now are probably going to own Watkins this week. I I I mm. fathom. Um, I think we're looking at about kind of 40, 50% effective ownership. And I, I don't like playing the EO game, but in especially in a blank game week when you've got constricted options. And, it, and you're at the rank you are, it probably makes sense. Well. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and, and also, oddly, I mean, yeah, Chelsea away and Leicester away, not the best double game week, but kind of the sandwich of games outside of that and the singles kind of make up for it almost yeah. oddly. This week, Bournemouth for home, but they are improving. Um they are, they've done a lot better actually in terms of the SGC, and um, but still a decent matchup. And the game week thirty, Forest at home as well. So you come out of it in quite a nice way. And he's the easy, obvious keeper, simple pick. So I, I think I'm probably going to go there. I mean, you mentioned Havertz. I mean, he's obviously the kind of player I'd have gone for in the past, in my past kind of incarnations as a, a punty Tom. Um, some people would replace the P with a C, but there you go. Um three home games in a row, um Everton, Liverpool and Villa, and then Wolves away in 30. On penalties, delicious finish this weekend. Um a bit of forgiveness needed for Havertz. Um, <laughs> he's, he's doing okay in the data. Um but no 32 for Havertz either. So he probably wanted to have to transfer out eventually as well. Um yeah so I unless you're free hitting of course. Um but I, I think I've we're looking at Ben Chilwell at the moment if I was going for Chelsea. Um, mm-hmm. Elsewhere, I mean, Solanke, as you said, high on the drunk man FPL reviews list. Um, benchable, I think, probably is the key thing. Benchable and nails. Yeah, that is true. Yeah. So if you've bench boosted now, if you've bench boosted already, um, he's got a decent double, can become sub one, you know, and I think he's like 40th in terms of non pen SGI, according to FB refs, and nowhere. The, other, the only other ones were um, Isaac and probably maybe Wilson, um, but who knows what's going on there? Yeah, I think the minutes starts issue is still there on those, so they've kind of killed each other, really. Yeah, and Newcastle have been so low on the list of XG for team as well that it yeah. just doesn't feel investable at the moment. So, yeah, I, I guess it's a an obvious Watkins pick up for me. A decent fits just going forward. Game of Thrones, who um, is actually kind of on the cusp of being benchable as well. So, I mean, it's 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 not the worst kind of pickup and we've both kind of tipped him as being potential <laughs> entry into the top 10 overall for the rest of the season which would be kind of I think he'd be the first player to make it since I think it was Emmy Martinez a couple of years ago um, but other than that you know a very very small number of Villa players have ever made it so hey there we go right okay well uh, quite a long section actually so we think uh, the 8th to 10th may drop out of the uh, the top 10 overall we think that Kane Paul and definitely 200 club, Rashford, Salah, probably, and then one of the Arsenal. We don't know who. Um, we think that maybe Paul and does go this week, but there is maybe a case to keep him. But probably we're both inclined to go with the herd here. It's not a bad thing to go with the herd sometimes. I mean, we'll come back here and be very contrite when obviously Paul and does fire a hat trick past Liverpool that he had. But there we go. And maybe Watkins is the obvious one to bring in. But if you do fancy Havertz or do fancy other option uh, like Solanke or whatever, uh, then do go ahead. Um, I did like, you know, for example, Brendan Johnson, but he went off injured this week. And same I know. It's a shame. So there you go. Right. Let's take a break there. And I'll be back uh, just, and we'll be back in just a minute. 
Right, we're back and uh, I had quite a few questions this week actually. Um, so best to kind of look through. It's very kind of retro to spend the second half doing a Q&A, but hey, there we go. Sometimes the market conditions make it that way. First question this week, um, saving a transfer for the game which went nine set up. FPL Corona asks, is it ideal to save a transfer 29, even if bench boost has been played already? Chilwell and Madison are looking up chances he wants to make. Um, well, I guess it's ideal for what it's, it's only ideal if it suits his team, right, Lucy? It's a very simple kind of way of looking at it. Um, so maybe we should look at the players potentially instead. I mean, Madison, Chilwell, any interest in these guys? Um, a lot of interest, actually. I think if I'd been on a different path, Madison would have been in there. Um, I think I'm very likely to bring in Chilwell this week or potentially bring in Chilwell this week anyway. Um, yeah, so I think they're both very good options. I think with regards to the question, I think it really depends on your team. I think if you're well set for 28 already, maybe you've got 10 or 11 players, then maybe you could save. But if if you've already said you've you've used your bench boost and you're not planning to use it in 29, I'd be tempted to get what I can out of 28 and get them both in, actually. Um, mm. You might as well change a blank fixture for, for a fixture, um, <laughs> knowing that you don't really need to go particularly big on 29 if you've bench boosted. So I would be tempted to get them sorted now. It doesn't look like Madison is injured. It seemed for a while that Rodgers wasn't quite sure if he was or wasn't, and that was actually putting me off quite a lot. It seemed to be that every press conference, it was like, oh, he should be fine, um, which was, you know, <laughs> unnecessarily ambiguous, but there we go. Um, so I think he's fine. So I would probably, if you, unless you've got a really good setup for 28, which most people haven't, um, I would be doing it now. But I don't know what your thoughts are on that. Tom? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I'd be shocked if anyone didn't have anything other than, than an already very good game week 29. If it was tomorrow, I think most people would have a very strong double game week. And if you don't have a bench boost, you're going to have a benching headache because your team will be strong already. Mm. So I wouldn't be I surprised if making both chances makes a lot of sense. I mean, I mentioned Madison a little bit earlier on, last couple of weeks, very unlucky. And I think he's, he's four for chances created on some fields over the last five games he's played. Very good fits just to come. Uh, Chilwell, I mean, I, I've, I'm interested as well. So it looks like we're going to be both making the orthodox transfers this week in terms of maybe buying Watkins and Chilwell ahead of the double game week. Uh, but yes, uh, last four weeks, average position has been great. I'm um, feeling his way back to full fitness. Um, mm -hmm. for, for me, he's always sort of been the clear pick over Reese James when both are fit. Um, I feel like he elicit uh, Reese James elicits a sort of kind of Stockholm syndrome amongst FPL managers. Like, oh, James is always an option. But James is great. He was great for me last year. And he can attack. He gets attacking stuff, right? Um, but I mean, the the key difference is always that James can be called on to defend. I think we said this preseason. He can be called on to do defending, whereas you know, Chilwell is just vibes on that front. Um, and he's kind of a, a bit of a throwback in many ways because he's kind of cover the attack with a defender that kind of pick which i really like I and mean, we'll cover the Chelsea defense on mass in just a second but he's second for attempts over the last four amongst defenders seems to have outperformed on the data so 1.22 more goal involvements uh, for the last couple of returns than he should have got but nonetheless you no know, Chelsea fans all over like uh, i spoke to my friend jack about this a little while back um i said he and james are a big part of whether they purr or not and i i'm very kind of keen to own one of them kind of more in a Trent-esque way for their attacking returns rather than their defensive ones. And the fact that Chilwell isn't going to be asked to defend, but it may be kind of replaced with Kukurea at some point. Um, he is obviously still kind of readjusting to playing uh, kind of uh, with regular intensity, but I, I feel like it's definitely worth a look and definitely worth a punt. I feel like he's looking like the next sort of potential <laughs> engaged manager bandwagon. I kind of want a piece of that this week. Um, as opposed to next, so you know, I, I, yeah, I yeah, ruining chances and captains a bit. I, yeah, I, I quite like the chill well idea. Um, I've, I've always had a soft spot for him, so um, now he's back and looking okay, and uh, he's definitely one that I'll be looking at, that's for sure. Uh, let's just widen this a little bit. So, Daniel at Euro FPL says, uh, you know, Chelsea defense might be a useful touch point to discuss if you get a crystal ball out this week. I mean, uh, I think three home games in a row, Lucy, especially Everson straight away. You can see why people are moving on or looking at moving on to Chilwell. And I suspect that he's going to be the one who next gets over 10% from nowhere, isn't he? 
Yeah, I don't think I'd be looking at anyone but Chilwell and Kepa. I don't think anyone else is worth looking at. It's really down to those two. I actually am one of those Reese James lovers and would normally go for him, but he's quite clearly a health risk. He hasn't had any <laughs> minutes. So I think you're just waiting for a for a disaster there where you realise that he's been benched again or disappeared. Uh, so I wouldn't be going there. Uh, so yeah, I think it really is down to Chilwell and Kepa. I think... You know, you mentioned that Chilwell's minutes might have to be managed because he's kind of finding his way to fitness. I, th- I think Potter's under such pressure at the moment that actually if, if someone's doing well and they're finding the back of the net or assisting goals, then I don't think he's got a lot of choice but to play him if he can. So I, I don't have as many reservations as I would if they were doing well when I think mm. they might be more tempted to rotate. Um, And also Kukurea has been pretty terrible recently. So Yeah, apart from when he's playing at left centre back, in which case suddenly he flourishes. Yeah. Which but that's was... great, right? For Joel yeah, Absolutely, absolutely. Absolutely. And as for Laqueta, we don't really know what the prognosis on him. No. Um, Loftus Cheek seems to be kind of the utility man uh, of that yeah. team. Yeah. Um so yeah, there's a Solly a Solly March esque Ruben Loftus Cheek. Uh, just kind of play wherever the manager kind of tells him to. I feel like he's a new Solly March, except in Chelsea. Uh, Chelsea. Um, yeah, I, I definitely agree with you. I think that yeah, I, I'm just really interested basically in Chilwell, and I might, I might be doing that on on Wednesday night or whatever. Uh, the last six game weeks in terms of SGC, Chelsea are sixth overall, which is it's pretty good. And Bryson and Brentford are the first and second respectively. <laughs> so yes. Anyway, yeah, let's hope that that kind of comes through. But uh, uh, Chelsea have conceded two more goals than they should have, according to expected data. Three home games on the on the horizon, a few big wins under their belt. I really wonder if they've turned the corner. Um, and I think that it, that's kind of almost the most exciting part of FPL for me these days. When we've spoken about this times out of number, about kind of being able to forecast, all right, people are always say, uh, have said that this guy's rubbish. Suddenly there's a turn in opinion and suddenly they become great, sort of around we're on. Um, maybe not rubbish to great, but you know, sort of with the Bryce midfielders or something, they went from fashionable to suddenly being in everyone's teams. Could it be the case this happens? And Kepa in the engaged core is so highly owned as well that adding in a defender, albeit the rarest of things, a premium wing back who's got that attacking sort of potential about him to benefit from the potential Chelsea clean sheet, especially this week in limited options, that seems like a really good idea to me. So, yeah. Go, go chill well, or, or don't if you don't want to. I, I really wasn't sure about the chill well thing, but you're really talking me around. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, don't, don't do it, Lisa. Don't do it. I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll do it. I'll, I'll be the test case, and then um, you'll see how you see where it goes with you. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I, I've, I've been very, um, the, the, I think the only sort of um, thing for a clean sheet is uh, Everton, what do they do? Crosses. <laughs> um, and um, they've not been great at dealing with no, those so no. far. Um, so that, that, you may be kind of overly relying on those. Uh... On, a, on the counterpoint, what, who do Everton have on the end of those crosses? True. Maybe Demarai Gray's cut sort of the, the top of his hair. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's definitely worth mentioning. Um, and I think it's, it's it's not it's not it's not a bad double, is it? So I mean, obviously, I, I think if if some people are looking at buying Liverpool, for example, then maybe you're going to have more of a question uh, than you would otherwise. Um, but it's, it's, it's not. It's not the worst double in the world. Villa home and uh, Liverpool at home. The only thing is, if we're both buying Watkins, <laughs> what the hell are we doing? Um, yes, yeah, so if you if you've got Chilwell, you've got those attacking returns sort of uh, inbuilt in, in in that purchase, and yeah, you, just, you just kind of hope for that and hope that he's fit enough. If he doesn't call up for England, especially, probably going to be okay there. So yeah, go Chilwell unless you don't want to, and I, I'm not not telling you uh, to do that because content creators get burnt at the stake for doing that sort of thing. Next question. Uh, further to Game 29 setup. Uh, Mike Lowe asks on a similar death cell note with Forland. Obviously, this one for next week, but maybe worth mentioning here. Is it too fixture blinkered to come off Arsenal assets in or after 29, given doubles and better runs for United, City, Bryson, and Leicester? Uh, free hit 32 um, obviously makes it easier, but their weakened performance makes it harder. Uh, plus, leaves home in Game 29 as well. So you're selling them in quite a good week. I mean, where do you stand right now? Obviously, it's going to change by when we get there, but where are you? I don't know where I am. <laughs> I was fairly sure when we planned out the wild cards that Odegaard was going. The closer we get to it, the more nervous I get. And at your rank, I don't know if I would be doing it at all. 
Um, I think at my rank, where I'm not really pleased with where I am, then maybe I could still be tempted into the sale. Um, I think the issue with them is that you want to own them long term, but they're difficult to make the case to use transfers to get them back when mm. you already need to get Haaland back. And probably Haaland is the bigger priority from an EO perspective. So I my my kind of confusion there is if I do sell them, which I'm not against doing because I, I, there could be upsides doing it. I don't see how I easily get them back. The upside is that it could allow you to pivot from one to another if you're not happy with who you're on, hmm. um, which is a potential thing. Like, you know, there Absolutely. are a few white owners still going around. They want to be that happy with him. Might be that people are liking Martinelli now that Jesus is back and Nketi is injured and all that kind of stuff. So it might be that you, it allows you to kind of oscillate from one to the other in a kind of fairly neat way instead of having to do the sideways move which I did which undoubtedly didn't really work um so there's that but yeah I I'm really undecided at the moment I feel like you're coming more and more towards a conclusion on that one yeah maybe I'm becoming cautious in my old age Lucy but I'm I'm really starting to wonder about the initial plan that we both mentioned about selling Odegaard and Gabriel as well. Um, Gabriel's more of a, oh, he's just scored 14 points. But the thing is that he was in my team from game week one for that exact reason, that the corners are aimed in his general direction. <laughs> and and versus Leeds at home in 29 versus selling them for doublers of questionable trustworthiness. It, it just, I, I remember the question we had last week from FPL Panic, I think it was, and we said that Arsenal were the trustworthiest guys this year. I know it's not a word, yeah, bear with me. And, and and we saw that kind of born out in the 200 club piece in the first half, that I think that those guys are likely to kind of make it. Um, at least it, it doesn't seem like it's unfeasible for them to kind of get somewhere near there. I did reference Bruno and Madison as candidates to break into the top 10, as you did as well. So they're going to remain on the radar, both of those sort of guys. I and mean, Casemiro actually being out may kind of be the excuse I might need to not consider Bruno as much as I otherwise would have. But my concerns regarding heeding the lessons of the past and not chucking the baby out of the bathwater when it comes to big double in 29, as Michael sort of touches on, might possibly be something I'll be bearing in mind. Well, it will be something I'm bearing in mind, actually. Um, because I think this season I made a point of not falling prey to the inevitable hysteria online. And that's going to reach fever pitch, I guess, around doubles and things like that. People are going to be kind of going, oh, you know, I want to get to 14, 15 doublers. You know, I'm going to sell Saka, Kane. You know, all these players are gone. They're gone. I'm going to be getting in Castagna. I'm going to be getting in X, Y, and Z. So, I mean, if the double government was tomorrow, Lucy, I'd be bench boosting with Kane, Gabriel, Odegaard, and Saka all in my team as single game weekers and going for quality over quantity. And I, I'm really hoping that I can stay kind of around there. So what happens, see what happens in the, in, in the international break. Maybe it could be an injury or something, which could kind of make the decision for me. But especially if I'm looking to use two free transfers this week, I think I, I might kind of be that that one contrary voice who kind of goes, oh, actually, I'm, I'm not going to go... Um, Two footed into the dub into kind of getting loads of doublers. I just don't think it's the way. I, I, I think I I will almost certainly lose Gabriel. Um, for better or worse, I okay. think he'll probably go. Yeah, he's got he, Liverpool, I think, in first year, isn't he? So there's, there's definitely uh, him him for uh either getting Estepinian back. So I think he would be the guy to go for if I bought in Chilwell. Or him going for a shore or something has definitely crossed my mind. Um, but I think he's the one. I, I keep them double Arsenal mids at their price, which has become touched on earlier. Seem it's keeping them to seem sort of a good practice, really. Uh, Gabriel's the more, most sort of vulnerable, I think. Yeah, I think so. I think um, the the doubt that's come in my mind on the Gabriel one was that I had basically earmarked Shaw to come in, and obviously the Casemiro sending off has sort of dented his appeal slightly. So. I think I still will lose him, but um, it's definitely not obvious. Um, and I, as I said, I, I haven't ruled out Odegaard going either. So difficult to say. It's not the greatest double as well. It's Newcastle away, Brentford at home, for sure. I mean, it's one of those where if you got a clean, if there was a clean sheet, then that would be a massive sort of 
Dempsey or Eo if didn't own one of them. But equally, it's kind of one as well where I'm not entirely confident of the clean sheet happening. So, yeah, one for future time and future leaves to deal with, that's for sure. Because we just, we just don't know at this point. <laughs> there have been injury which could completely send us all into a tailspin. Um, next question as well, again, about the game between nine set up. FL Auger, um, what, make one for humor here, Lucy. It says, if you're currently sitting on 10 players or 11 players and you're happy with your team, that's what he means. Is it worth replacing March for a 28 player, then bringing in Mc, uh, McAllister in 29? Uh, Lucy said earlier, you think McAllister is the better pick than March. I mean, could this be a way of, I mean, yeah, it's not as if that's hurt us in the past, of uh, hiding a move uh, for you know, moving March to McAllister like we hid De Bruyne, uh, De Bruyne to Foden not really long ago? I don't know what you mean. I don't remember that. Um, no, um, yeah, I don't think that March is a lot worse than McAllister. So to me, I can't really justify the free transfer wiggle involved there. And if you're saying that you've got 10 players, then why don't you get 11? Like that, that's what I'd be wondering. That there's surely got to be a, a better I, one. I, I guess if you were doing March to someone this week and then doing another sort of shuffle. So, okay. Yeah. yeah so get you it, get yeah. to eleven. This so the same with me selling Estupinian this I week just, to get to eleven. You know. I just feel that there's a there's got to be a better like opportunity <laughs> there, to there, leverage. There must, there must be a catch. <laughs> <laughs> just I just feel like there's got to be a better way to leverage value out of your squad than effectively doing a fairly long sideways move for a player that is better, but maybe not con- considerably better. I think, as I said earlier. If that own goal had been a marked goal, we wouldn't even be having this conversation. No. So uh, I, I don't know if... It really depends on your team. I, I can't see your team, so I don't exactly know what the situation is. But I would think that most teams can find a better upside than that move. I just... I, I... The only thing in mind for me is what I said earlier about most teams in 29 actually being quite good by default. So maybe it is a case of even now optimizing for that double game week. It's also a fair point to say: Are you bench boosting or not? Because that's probably yeah. yeah that's, that's, if, you that's, that's, bench, that's... if you aren't bench boosting, then maybe it's okay. Yeah, I, mean, I, I personally think that McAllister is a much better player than March, um, which is I've been unswayed by the solid train the whole time. Um, so I, I kind of be behind it if you share that conviction. You've you've watched March over the last four or five years. He's been in the Premier League and just realise now, oh, actually... He's yeah, been... but Brighton are a very different animal now, aren't I, I they? Know, but you, you, you don't you... need to be very good to score goals in this team, I don't think, because uh, that's how good they are. As Barack Obama once said, you could put lipstick on a pig, but it's still a pig. I mean, it's... I just don't think he's that bad. I don't, like, I don't think he's that good. He gets. But how many of them has he actually converted? Well, I mean, he can't legislate for Jack Harrison literally jumping... Yeah, I, 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 I know, but, it's, it's, it, but the whole thing has been him trading off, I think it was two double-digit returns a few weeks ago. Uh, but Matoma as well has got his own problems. So he doesn't seem to do anything in the underlying stats, but somehow comes through. So again, he's a bit of a miracle worker. I mean, they've all got their own kind of asterisks around them, I suppose. Um, it, it, it really depends if you're... Auger... Uh, which one you kind of, if you've got a really strong feeling about one, then, then fine. I, I can kind of see why you'd use this blank to make a move because you can get, like, I'm probably going to be doing it, right? Selling my voice opinion for Chilwell. Um, and I can sign 29 if I get him back in for maybe you know, Gabriel, or maybe even Rico Henry if I'm bored of Brentford or you know, whatever and take it up to 11 this week. So take on this week. And then next week, knowing that my team's already going to be strong, as it is for everybody by default, it, it kind of feels like a solution to doing it. There's always going to be that thing where you think, oh, God, you know, in the future, this may be seen as me being kind of galaxy brained and uh, falling over the size of my own brain. <laughs> but um, I don't know, it, it, it kind of it kind of feels like it's something you could do um, to get yourself up to 11 this week and then kind of as a consequence, as a byproduct of that move. Um, get the Brighton defender that you think is better, the Brighton field you think is better. I mean, it, is, it is a solution, potentially. That's the only thing I'd say. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, moving on to the more fun questions. 
<laughs> Dan, a poor fella, who do you envisage being relegated? Uh, I'm actually, I'm... yeah, I was about to say, Tom, we should start with your opinion first because mine's going to be more emotionally. Yeah, <laughs> I'm so I'm I'm going to do the opposite, and I'm going to take uh, five thirty eight, the political pollsters, um, in terms of the relegation battle. Uh, what's really interesting about it is that it's it's very difficult to call who's going to get seventeenth overall uh, they reckon that there are five teams in the running uh pe- teams who have got a 30 percent chance all the way to teams who have got a six percent chance of being relegated uh, the final five according to them are going to be leeds bournemouth nottingham forest and Everton in that order um and they think that uh yeah nottingham forest and, and uh, sadly southampton are the two teams who are over 50 percent likely to be relegated um what do you think yeah, I think it's um, Southampton, Bournemouth and one of Leeds or Forest is where I'm at with it. Um, I think the hope for us as Saints fans is that we have seven points from 12 under Sellers, so we aren't performing as badly as we were under Jones. Um, I think we might pay the price for that uh, little experiment, um, and that obviously has included uh, a draw at Old Trafford and a win at Stamford Bridge, so mm-hmm. they're happening in fairly tough fixtures. I didn't give us any hope in, so that's that's a maybe possibility. But I think we're likely to go. I think that West Ham and Leicester probably have enough quality in their attacks to pull themselves out of it. I think Palace are probably worth talking about because they don't. Yeah. They spent so long in mid table that we haven't really spoken about them. Is is it no no shot on target for the last three games? Isn't it? That's correct. Yeah, it's a new league record which Southampton don't don't hold. So, <laughs> like, um, yeah, one of those bad records that. For some reason, we don't have. Um, but yes, they're on a big slide. They have no win in six, I think it is. And Forrester, much the same in terms of a terrible recent record. So yeah. I feel like those are the, the teams that are stalling at exactly the wrong time. So, yeah, I think it is likely to be Southampton, Bournemouth and one of, um, who did I say? Leeds and Forest. Leeds but, and uh, Forest, yeah. Yeah. I think Overton will die shit, so that'll be fine. Yeah, I think it would be, um, given their spend over the summer, quite amusing if Forrest did go down. No, I've got nothing against the City of Nottingham. Forest fans, I love you Brian Clough. You just hate Forrest, don't story. you? Just hate yeah, them. yeah. <laughs> any club associated with Manuel Dennis, I'm I'm all over like a fly on <laughs> excrement. No, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm, I, I do think that's kind of one thing that's worth very fine. Yeah, you know, really interesting if you look at the look at the data as their kind of predicted data as well. Like the race for fourth and the race for seventeenth seems to be the two sort of main flashpoints that we're going to see. Um, basically, the whole the whole league is involved in one of those. Basically, I know. I know. It's, it's <laughs> I'm not sure if Villa, Fulham, Brentford, or a Chelsea fan. Yeah. In which case, that yeah, your season your season's done. Your yeah. season's done. Which moves us actually really nicely onto the final question this week. Oh yeah, his friend of the pod, Sam, FPL Pricey. At what point, he asks, do we look at team motivation as part of our decision-making process? Oh no, not, not on the beach question, Sam. What are you, what, what are you doing? Uh, E.g. teams fighting for their lives or teams whose seasons are over. He says, I'm not sure it's something you can rely on, but I'm interested to hear your takes. Yeah, I mean, this is one we used to do a lot. I think I think it's one where the long-term listeners will know. I thought I was on to onto something. We listened to it, and every single year, it just proved to be absolute BS. I mean, I'm, I'm picking the myriad of reasons why players perform or don't perform. Is is there's no sort of one size fits all. You can't be like, oh, you know, he wants to move, therefore he's going to perform very well, or you know, they're, they're fighting relegation, therefore they're going to perform well. It, it does happen every now and again, but it's it's like a the Texas sharpshooter fallacy, where you know, the idea is that a, a, a sharpshooter. In inverted commas, shoots loads of shoots his guns randomly um into the side of the barn. He walks up to the barn, gun shots everywhere, and he kind of draws a circle in chalk around a few which are near each other and says, There's a trend. Um you know, I'm a good shooter. Uh no, no, it but there's it, it's just too disparate really to tell whether on the beach is a real thing. For every Luca Dean who couldn't stop performing after having apparently nothing to play for, there's a Norwich who couldn't do anything at zero points over nine games, I think it was in Project Restart, apparently despite fighting for their lives. 
Um, so yeah, it, it's one to check in on, but it's a very kind of case by case thing, really, when it comes to teams and specifically in FPL players. So it's, it's not really for me. But for you, I'm assuming, Lucy, you're buying JWP, Onowachu, uh, maybe Perot, and um, you know, just just hoping that Southampton are, are well up for it, right? Up, oh, absolutely. No, um, I'm not talking. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think we've probably shown that we have no faith in the idea, given that we've both said that we fancy Villa and Chelsea players, who we've just covered, are one of the few, you know, two of the few teams that don't have to worry about. Um, the top four or relegation. Um, so, you know, I'm not particularly buying into it at the moment. Um, I mean, Villa could get the... For them, it's a little bit different. So, obviously, they can't get the top four, but they could get the Europa League. Or they could, you know, feasibly for them, they're the sort of... At the sort of level where the, even the Conference League, that could have yeah. a material difference on them as a club. And we do know that Unai Emery is king of the Europa League. He so. is, yes. Apart from when he's the Arsenal manager. Oh yeah, sorry about that. I forgot about that. <laughs> Oopsie. That's all right. It's matter to me. I'm an FPL man, but yeah, let's uh, just throw that in there. Yeah. So in conclusion, we're not subscribing to On the Beach. Sorry about that, Sam. Well, next time he comes on, ask him about that. Um, I'm sure Sam's probably just having moments thinking, "I want to be in flip flops." He just wishes that Southampton were on the beach. That's basically what it is. Yeah, yeah. Well, is there a beach in Southampton? There isn't one, is there? No, no, it's just, it's just, just a Not. port. It's just yeah, a port, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Right. Okay. On to transfers and captains. Um, I think it's just worth mentioning quickly. Um, free hit team. If there was one, I I did have a look on the on the train ride home. Um, what team I put together? Don't worry, I'm not going to not going to impose on you and ask you what would you have done. Um, but yes. but the, the one would be uh, I think Martinez in goal, Bournemouth at home, uh, Shah and Trippier uh, away at Nottingham Forest, Chilwell and Jenko uh, in midfield, Saka, Marcelli and Son. Uh, Son, why not? Punt it out. Yeah, why not? Yeah. Uh, up front, Watkins, Tony and Kane, and um, decide who you want the caps now of those. But I think that that's a fairly straightforward free hit team. It's quite encouraging for us as well because our, our team covers most of those players. I know, but if you're free hitting this week, I mean, this is a compound differential thing. Maybe there were yeah. people who wildcarded last week who went big on United, for example, against Southampton. Like yeah. Josh, Josh Moore's cheating did that, which, you know, to be fair, he's gotten very unlucky, really, with uh, Casemiro deciding to uh, give the two footed hello. <laughs> you know, there you go. Right. Uh, so, on to proper transfers and captains. I mean, how many you in this week? I'm assuming. 10 or are you going to are you going to do the two free transfers like i'm probably looking um, at i haven't decided it's there's a the the harland to watkins thing is definitely happening or more or less definitely happening the esther pinyan to chillwell thing i haven't really decided on because i haven't really decided what i'm doing with odegaard so they all kind of bleed into each other um so that's a bit up in the air so yes 10 or potentially 11 i assume you're more fixed on 11 yeah, I, I'm definitely looking at that. I was, it's worth saying that I, I wrote this, my notes during my lunch break at work today. Um, and I, I was just like, oh, you know, I'm being really aggressive doing this. Most people are going to come out and have 10, 10 players. Most people are going to want two free transfers over this national break. And looking at looking at the Bird app, which I, I, reckon, I recognize is obviously a bit of a, a, a compromise sort of a view. Um, but a brief glimpse on the way home, on the train home, it just seemed that everyone else was making the same moves as well. So yay for homogeny, basically. And then people who was obviously who wildcarded in game twenty seven are likely ending up with this team too, because they're just doing Estupinian um to um uh, Chilwell and just seeing how it goes. I mean it's it's really just a wait and see in terms of the early guard question, isn't it? Over uh, IB see what happens, get 11 out this week and see what happens from there. Because we've got a decent team. Like If things get really, really bad, like players are literally like, you know, injured for a long time, then I wouldn't feel too bad about taking a minus four or whatever. But you know, I think it might be that I end up with one free transfer and then I decide if I want to use it or not. I mean, it's easy to say now that we're two, three weeks out from doing it. But I mean, right now, if the adventure is tomorrow, so earlier on, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't, I, I'd be likely to just have free Arsenal against Leeds and Kane away at, at Everton and just have 12 doublers. But, you know, I, I might change my mind 
over the next few weeks. But yeah, this week, really looking at that Kilwell and Watkins by it's kind of plodding along with the herd. It's not very exciting this year, which I'm sure you, this is what you've been doing for years. So <laughs> hey, it's just it's my first sort of uh, my first sort of time uh, for a while being at the, in the situation. But I'm really interested in this captaincy. Because I haven't really got a feel yet. I don't think we've quite kind of got there because it's sort of the deep breath before um, the pause in terms of um, Wednesday's fixtures still to come. I, I'm not. Has, has there been a consensus really around one of the two? Like I'm Boston Kane, same as you. Like Talisman theory, really. Like Stacker is part of an orchestra, whereas Kane is the soloist. And He's I also thought. Got- I mean, I'm, I'm not really one that loves, you know, people's records against teams because I always think teams change loads and managers change, etc. Mm-hmm. But Kane's record against Southampton is terrible. I mean, great, it's, it's ter- but terribly, terrible for me. Terribly great, yeah. <laughs> terribly great. 19, 19 returns against them in his career uh, in 19 games. And he's oddly the most assists against them, which is obviously Son, uh, when he assisted them four times. Oh, uh, gosh, yeah. Yeah, That's so uh, just after Leicester, it's uh, Southampton, uh, and been really like St. Mary's, apparently. Yeah, so that, again, makes me think... Yeah, I don't know. I I always find it very difficult to evaluate uh, captaincies when one of them is against Southampton because I have this weird, as anyone that's listened to this at any length, a weird anti-Southampton bias where I just assume we're going to concede 10 goals every game. So I I find it really difficult to evaluate, so I I naturally gravitate towards Kane. But I think Saka is also a great option. I I think both both will hit over 100%. Yeah, I just, that's the unfortunate thing about it, isn't it? I I just feel like with Saka and Odegaard, I've got kind of fingers in the pie of the orchestra, but I feel like Kane is. If there's a Tottenham, it's a Talisman theory, isn't it? If there's, if there's a Tottenham goal, it's likely to be Kane. If there's an Arsenal goal, you've got loads of different individuals it could be, and you've got to be hopeful that you get through with a lucky dip. Mm. It, it is a very difficult one. Really, I mean, uh, Garo said to me earlier, you know, it's got to be an Arsenal player uh, at home uh, this week, and it, it, I, I understand that, I understand that completely. Um, but uh, I, 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 does it come down to gut? That's a horrible thing where it come down to. I think I'll, I'll see what all of the what the kind of the indicators say and decide from there. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's just definitely um, I, for me. I think. I wouldn't be surprised if I end up just leaving it on Kane really now, just because yeah, it's plus, yeah Southampton, yeah, they're yeah. going to win. They're, they're going to win four three, but Kane's going to score a hat trick. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Win. Keep keep the straight script. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. It. yeah. There we go. Well, I think that's your lot. Um, we'll have a week off after the blank, and then be back the week before the big double to allow international breaks and they're going to set their course. Um, but yeah, uh, ah. It would be nice to have a, just a conversation, I think, after all the game week has been done, just kind of in that yeah. weird sort of space between game weeks and not be like, oh, we've got to wait for a little while or, you know, there's a big sort of impending decision we've got to make. I think it would be nice to have one X fixture future thing to do, to kind of enjoy. So, yeah, looking forward to that happening in not very long. Yes, excellent. Um, thanks for listening, everyone. We were Who Got the Assist. You can find Tom on Twitter at WGTA underscore FPL, and you can find me at Lucy Hynett with two Ts. If you enjoyed listening to this, please like and subscribe to the podcast. For new listeners out there, if you think you'll be coming back, please hit that five-star rating across platforms like iTunes and Spotify so more people can enjoy the pod. Yep, that's it. Thanks very much for listening. Um, if you do for some reason want more of me uh, for whatever reason and um, next week i'll be guesting on our friends uh, above average fpl at above average fpl all one word uh, yes Lisa, they scrape the bottom of the barrel and um, you've been on there yeah, before i've you know, been on now they've got to get you on flapjack um, <laughs> even a, a few names i'm not going to mention who uh, that's really dredging at uh, the bottom they found me uh, so yeah, I'm on that next week, next Sunday. Um, do look out for that. Um, yeah. Um, if not, we'll be back. Um, well, wow, that's quite a long time actually. On the 27th. Um, so if you're on the 28th. Oh wow. March. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, good luck in the blank double game week. No, in the blank game week. Good luck with the rest of this double game week. And um, we'll speak to you very very soon.
Farewell.